We are in chapter 5. Before I start, let me say that I am a little bit behind posting videos. Yeah, yeah, a lot. Um, what we did in class, I haven't got it posted yet. I, I just got on, on Saturday, we just got uh, switched over from Comcast to AT&T Fiber. Hopefully we've got decent internet now, and I will get that done. I haven't been here at school uh, this week to, to finish all that up. Anyway, but we're going to kind of move forward. Um, most of y'all know what we're working on, which is um, interviewing process, right? doing research, building resumes, finding companies, applying for work, all that stuff, all the fun stuff, right? And then there was a little part that we didn't get to that I, that I put on the, the, the lecture um, that I am going to be uploading, which is on negotiating. How to negotiate in your interview and actually get what you're looking for. Okay, we're going to come back and revisit that and look at that in more in detail when we get to the point of interviewing one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. But today I want to talk about, continue talking about this idea of culture. So in Chapter 5, the... Culture that a workplace has it becomes very important. Okay, the culture that a workplace has, this is called diversity in the workplace, or getting to know your diversity. Now, this term diversity, don't let it throw you for a loop, but before I get started on my end of it, what would you say is diversity? Different backgrounds and tasks. All right. Different backgrounds and tasks. Different skill sets. Will the PowerPoint be posted online? Yeah, that's an ex example of diversity. Omar has a different opinion on that, I guess. Okay. Um, yes, by the way, the PowerPoint will be posted online. An environment of different cultures and opinions. Um, Gala got my favorite word there, different cultures. And opinions. Um, different workers and environments, different workers. Now, it's interesting how 
Yo'ol used the derivative from the word diversity, and you all had different in your definition. Something is different. Um, let's look at take a look at our communication model for a second. We have our sender over here, our receiver, right? We are sending messages along this channel. We're getting feedback. But notice here we have this interference. And I'm going to add something to this picture. And this is this nebulous around the sender and around the receiver that I call culture. Culture. Um, Omar said environment. I like that word environment. All right. Culture is, um, can be thought of as an environment. And then Gala said opinions. And your opinions many times come from a a from the environment in which you um, exist, right? Um, now, I guess uh, the the question that comes to my mind, and this is a, a technical question, and I'm going to chase this uh, rabbit for a couple of seconds and then get back on track. All right. So, one of my one of the questions that people say is, is culture deterministic? In other words, um, does culture make you act in a certain way? And of course, um, from my perspective, a culture can influence you to act in a certain way, but it doesn't make you act in a certain way. Okay? Your environment can influence you. Your environment can push you into certain patterns Right, so unthinkingly, you can do, you can fall into certain patterns of life, certain patterns of speaking, certain patterns of acting. But I don't believe that it is deterministic in the sense of that you cannot change your culture. All right. Um, notice how these two people's different culture actually um, creates some of the interference. Right, that they are using that 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 um, interferes with the message getting through. Right. In fact, there are some people who add to it, and they add little boxes here um, on this side called the encoder, and another little box here called the decoder. Right kind of uh, from the perspective of translation, right? You have to translate your message into words, and hopefully words that the other person, um, and then they decode that message from their own experience and from their own culture and from their own environment. And so some of the message gets through and some of it gets cl clogged up in the decoding and the encoding process. All right. So enough of the Right, theoretical stuff on that perspective. Diversity is the idea that someone is from another culture, right? And the big word is the other, right? The other. Something that's not normal, something that's not. Um, the way we think that it should be. Something that stands out as separate from us. Right? The other. And this other um, can be another person, another habit, another, another skill set, another task, another way of doing things. All right. Before we go too far down this road, let me ask a, a, another kind of question over here about this different diversity thing. 
Is different good or bad? Is diversity good or bad? Oh, everybody says it depends. Come on, guys. You won't say good or bad. Um, I agree. It depends, right? If we're talking about doxy, right, orthodoxy is saying what is true about um, the faith, right? Heterodoxy is what is different, right? Hetero means different. Heterodoxy is what we call error or heresy, um, as they use. So that's an example of where different from a religious and a doctrinal point of view would be considered bad, right? Heterodoxy is what is different from orthodoxy, what is different from the agreed-upon and received dogma of the faith. But if you're going out in your garden and you have five different plants, or even 25, or even 55, or 505 different plants in the environment, that in itself is not a bad thing, right? Diversity is actually... Um, beneficial. It's beneficial for the environment. That's why um, we are always saddened by um, the the uh, species that are going extinct, right? The extinction of species. Because we think that in certain contexts, different is beautiful. All right, now, Coming back, to, um, applying these same principles here to a workplace environment. All right, a company has a has a service. They have a goal. They have a product or a, a, a variety of products that they offer, and they're trying to make money. Right, the bottom line of of the of the company is to make money. The bottom line in hiring you is to help them that make that money, right? Offer that service, fulfill that obligation, whatever it is. And as long as, as you can help them make money, then they're going to give you some of that money, right? There's this trade-off, right? This win-win between both of you. Um, now, in order to keep the company afloat, they need a bunch of different things going on, right? They need some people who can count money. They need some people who can write code. They need some people who can promote the product. They need some people who can make the product. They need engineers who can design the product. They have that creativity to design and, manu uh, and um, lay out the product, right? And so all these different skill sets is actually a benefit. It's a, um, an asset. And depending on the company and depending on what they're trying to accomplish, e uh, even a person who has a variety of different skills um, can be a, an asset to that company, right? A person who can wear more than one hat and do more, you know, a pony who can do more than one trick is um, definitely going to get... Uh, have a better shot, in, in some cases, at the gig. Now, there are certain things that um, where, you know, specializing in one specific thing guarantees you, you know, especially if it's something that's in high demand and very few people are going for it. Like engineers. Um, there, are, there are not enough engineers being manufactured in the school systems, more companies are having to kind of make lay engineers. They're trying. They're having to depend on other people who don't have the rigorous math skills and math training 
that is required um, to to do the 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 um, the calculus work in in design and uh, many companies are at the level where they are promoting the people who actually do have the math skills and the and the engineering perspective to uh, to get the job done. Um, from my perspective, if you have math skills, does not guarantee that you have leadership skills, right? But if you have math skills, um, you can at times see the big picture and you can see all the moving parts to the equation. So from that perspective, hopefully, um, you, you have a, a good perspective. And that's how a lot of companies see it. Um, all right, so diversity in the workplace is a good thing. We've established that. Um, so the other should not be a hostility view, right? The other should not be a binary necessarily, right? Good or bad, or good versus bad, right? There should be um, the different should be more like a symphony. And the symphony is one of my favorite um, one of my favorite perspectives on um, on on harmony and on uh, unity. A symphony is made up of many different sounding instruments. Right? It can be anywhere from 25 to 105. Um, and each one of them is, uh, has its own sound. Each one of them may not even be playing the same note. Right? They might not be going at the same speed. Some are going slower. Some are going faster. But this variety, this difference of expression all moving together with one goal in mind is what is going to produce the symphony, um, the, the, the overarching product of this, of this beautiful music that is going to be produced. And so in that case, in the case of a symphony, diversity is good, right? as long as they are all willing to submit to the overall the, to the overall goal right that's where diversity on a minute level um where some things are diverse whereas other things you agree to share, okay, and that's where culture comes in, right? Culture comes in where you all agree to share some things. You all agree to share a common language, right? Coming back to our principles of culture, you all agree to share a common uh, space, a common um, land, if you will, that you all agree to share common laws, right? Common um, uh, norms and ways of ways of behaving, and so you agree on some common values and beliefs. So the other becomes dangerous if they don't hold the same values, right? If they are undermining the values of the whole. If they're working against it, if they're working from a different set of values. So values is what comes down to the most important thing. And so for a company to be successful, 
They need to learn to articulate their culture. They need to say, what do we value? What is important to us? And do they have methods in place for sharing and teaching those values? All right? So... In um, the, the culture workspace, um, I had it right here. So being able to, um, the first word that we want to use here in, in sense of culture is assimilate. Assimilate. What is it going to take to get you up to where you can become part of the, um, the culture? Now, again, going back to this, um, the danger of the binary, um, one of my pet theories and one of my pet peeves is I don't think there is an all or nothing approach to culture, right? By becoming a part of a culture does not mean that you have to um, relinquish and leave behind all other cultures. Some, uh, some culture can um, have a performative aspect. And I think some of y'all would, would, would understand this um, in debate, that, that have been in debate before, that have judged debate, right? You can have a person debating neg um, on a topic that um, they don't believe, right? Um, they could... They could they can perform the norms, they can perform the culture, they can perform the values of a particular debate um, without actually holding those values. Now, that's a, that's a little bit of an extreme position. Um, you, uh, people are complex enough that they can participate in more than one culture, right? You can have your family culture, you can have your church culture, and then you can have your work culture, and they can all be somewhat different, if not quite different. Um, that's one of the myths uh, of diversity, is that someone who is different um, will mess up the culture that is here. right? By them holding any other culture... They will taint the culture that exists, and um, you know that's. I, I think that's a, a false way of looking at it. I don't have a, a lot of time to to explore that all the way to its fullest um, place, but um, you can participate in more than one culture at a time. And part of that participation is going to come down to having some skills in assimilation. All right? Some skills in learning a new culture. So the skills are... Culture competence, culture competence, perception checking, perception checking. Uh, I'm still working on this one. And 
And lastly, mutual respect. And I think this one here goes the furthest in um, to, to, to deal with the heart of the issue. Mutual respect. All right, that's where um, there are certain values that supersede other values, right? And the value of human of humanity, the value of human life, um, should supersede a lot of other secondary values um, when it comes to culture. All right, so culture competence is, you know, what does it take to become fluent in the language of the uh, of the of the culture that you're in, right? Um, if you if you adopt the values, at least while you're there, right? All right. So let's use some, let's use some examples. We're going to go to back to Amazon. That's the example that I've used before, and that's the one I am familiar with. Um, or Amazon.jobs. And we have um, their culture. Right? Working at Amazon, you come down to the bottom. They give you um, a definition of their culture. Their DNA is to become Earth's most customer-centric company. So their bottom line value above all else is, we could say it's humanity, right? Seeing people as people, as humans, as having needs, and my goal is to serve those needs. Right? What is it going to take for us to become part of that dynamic? Trying to discover anything that they might want to buy online, endeavors to offer its customers the lowest possible prices. The um, goal con continues today, but Amazon's customers are worldwide now, so have grown to include millions of consumers, sellers, content creators, and developers and enterprises. So, so when you talk about customer, the, that customer, that word customer can in, entail a lot of different kinds of people. Right? Some of them are consumers. They just buy stuff. But even your sellers are customers. Right? They are using your platform to um, to to be sub-sellers under you. Even your employees are customers in the sense, they're internal customers, in the sense that they help you take care of business so that you can serve, you know, the consumers, so that you can meet the, the expectations that you have to offer. Content creators, right? Amazon's getting very creative, right? They have the uh, streaming services now in which they actually are making content. Um, they curate a lot of knowledge. Um, they, um, the Amazon Web Services writes a lot of code, and a lot of the big tech companies actually run on the code that Amazon writes. So um, developers and enterprisers um, are part of their customers, right? Then you have your leadership principles, right? Customer obsession. We already said that. Um, ownership. Each person takes um, a certain um, takes control of the certain domain in which they are given. Um, invent and simplify. Constantly creating uh, and thinking and rewriting code if need be in order to make it simpler, etc. All right. So. To become competent 
in this culture, you have to start adopt, um, at least while you're at Amazon, you think like an Amazonian, right? You think, now, when you're at home sitting on your couch, you don't have to worry about your customers, right? Your customers will take care of themselves, but when you're clocked in and on the job, you know, that that, that is your culture. That's what you should be thinking about. You should be thinking, what can we do to take care of our customers? Where it's the, whether it's the customer in the cubicle right next to you, whether it's the customer that is um, helping with the Wi-Fi or the infrastructure or the customer, you know, go on and go on. Um, you, can, you can think any, any number of things, right? What is the customer looking for and what, and what can you do to help them as long as you're clocked in? So we can negotiate and navigate several different cultures, actually keeping good, healthy, personal boundaries between cultures and knowing that you are strong enough, smart enough, and able to keep good, healthy boundaries is actually a good thing, okay? Um, I'm, I'm using that in the sense both of your ethnic, ethnic culture as well as a work culture, right? Coming from another country and speak, continuing to speak your language and continuing to keep your customs and continuing to honor um, your traditions while at the same time learning new traditions and speaking a new language and in, entering into a new culture, you can do both, right? And it's a healthy person that is able to actually negotiate both, both of those things in the proper place and time. So assimilation is you adapting to that culture, but it does not mean that you have to lose the culture that you have, right? You can be competent in more than one culture at a time. That's my point. All right. As you are adapting... And as you're assimilating and as you're learning new, um, new formats, new things, um, then you have the opportunity to check and see how you're going, right? So what does, an, a, what does a fluently bilingual person look like? Right? What are the benchmarks of a fluently bilingual person? And who decides whether or not you are fluent, right? So you have these kind of these mile markers along the way that will help you. One of the ways in a company is, hey, you've got this down, you get a promotion, right? You move on to the next level. You have learned, you know, you passed your orientation period. Um, you have successfully executed you know, at least 80% of what you um, planned, um, you know, you can move up to the next grade. You can move up to the next level. You can get that next um, money, that next um, pay goal, those next benefits. And so um, being able to check up and being aware enough to ask people the questions um, in, in this perception checking is important. So, um, in the book, um, it, it gave us six tactics that uh, newcomers use in this perception checking. They, um, they may ask overt questioning. There may be indirect questioning. There may be third-party questioning. Um, testing the limits, right? Um, it's not wrong if, you know, if you didn't get caught, so to speak, right? Don't ask permission, ask forgiveness. Sometimes you can learn about culture the hard way. Um, you try it and it doesn't work, 
right? It goes over uh, not very well. Um, and then they use a couple of other ones called disguising conversation and surveillance, where you learn implicitly rather than asking questions, right? You learn by watching. So uh, you've probably heard of the old ex example of the, the Russian spy. Um, it was at, uh, sorry, the American spy in Russia who, you know, spoke Russian perfectly. Um, he knew the greetings and the salutes and all this kind of stuff. But there was one little thing. It was a minor etiquette thing at dinner. That whenever he sat down to a meal and he took his fork and his knife, cut off a piece of steak, and instead of um, serving himself with his left hand, right, he switched the fork back to his right hand in order to eat. That's an American thing, right? We cut our steak, we switch the fork back to our right hand, and then we serve ourselves with the right hand. There are other cultures that do it as well, but um, a lot of cultures don't. South America doesn't, right? You cut your steak, you have your knife in your right hand, your fork in your left hand, you cut it, you go ahead and take a bite, right? Um, and switching it to your right hand gave away um, that he wasn't native. He wasn't, you know, that, that one detail gave away that he was a spy rather than a native-born Russian. So um, culture is this interesting thing that, um, you know, how, what does it take to be, and, and obviously some cultures are more forgiving than others, right? That's where the mutual respect comes in. Um, some, some aspects of culture are not to die for, right? Um, and so it's important to, to keep our uh, wits about us, um, the example that I was get, just giving you about um, how to, the, the proper etiquette at table, um, if you don't know what the etiquette at table is, you can do this um, surveillance, right? Just watch what the next person to you does and follow their lead. Well, they may be out of etiquette too, but maybe take in a, a couple other people. You know, is everybody waiting for the host to begin before they you begin, right? When they set the plate down in front of you, what's the first thing you do? Which which instrument are you going to grab first? The, the knife, the fork, the spoon, right? Watch what the other people do and then follow their lead. Um, accept, this mutual respect comes in, accept that they have figured out some things even though it doesn't make sense to you. When you're first coming into a culture, you can probably see the culture a lot clearer, some aspects of the culture a lot clearer than anyone else can. Right? You can probably see um, some of their blind spots. However, they're not completely blind in every aspect. Sometimes it takes a while for you to figure out why do they do it that way and then realize that there is and there can be a good reason for them to do it that way. Right? Especially when you're coming into a new, in a new company, why do they do it that way? Well, if you're a good anthropologist, if you're, if you're a good ethnographer, you're going to write down all your questions. Why did they do this? Why do they do it that way? You know, you're going to write down all these things that are slapping you in the face that are so strange and different to the way you've always done things. And it's good to keep good notes on that. But in the interest of... Um, in the interest of harmony, right? In the interest of the symphony, in the interest of respect, 
embrace it, accept it, go with it, right? Until you figure out why they do it. And, and then if you get to a point of authority in the, in the culture, maybe they brought you in. Now, this is a different, uh, a different matter, right? If they bring you into it as an expert on something, and they are, and they feel like there is a deficiency in their company, and you are the man to fix it, you're the woman to fix it. Embrace that too, but learn to adjust with finesse. Learn to adjust with a with a calm hand, right? You don't just come in and take, rip everything apart. Some things feel like they need to be ripped apart. But it's best to at least understand and assimilate in the culture before you start making huge changes. All right. Now, we talked about their um, their uh, values, right? As we are trying to learn about their values, what are the things that we can get a hold of? All right, so we can learn the wording, but unfortunately, not every not every organization has as clearly thought out and articulated their culture as these here, right? So if we think of England or we think of America, a lot of times the American culture isn't clearly articulated. You know, to be an authentic American, you need to know this, 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 and this. You need to act this way and do this. Right? We don't do it that way. We do use education as an assimilation tool, right? Um, we teach you, uh, you know, a, a, a basic level of math that you should know. We teach you a basic level of literature. And one of the key purposes of literature is these are the highest forms of our thought over the last you know, the last centuries. Whether it's world literature or English literature or American literature or, um, you know, particular um, group literature, that literature expresses many different aspects of the ideals and the ideas of that culture. But there are other, but even if, you don't have one document that lays out all the main principles of value in the culture. There are things that you can observe that give us some clues. So one of them is artifacts. What are the things, what are the tangible things that um, are valuable to this culture? Right? If you are working for Apple, what do you think it is? going to be the iPhone, it's going to be the, the MacBook Pro, right? Um, perhaps the iPad. Those are tangible things. Those are tools that they use that the object itself speaks about the culture that created it, right? And you use those same tools to create other tools, right? It's interesting how that, how that um, in culture, culture making and culture perpetuating is cyclical, right? You make culture, culture doesn't stay static, it doesn't, you know, it's like, okay, you've learned it all, all right, it's done. Um, it, you're constantly learning, you're constantly in the process of co-creating, and as each new influence comes into the culture, it morphs and changes the culture in some ways, and, and people are, frankly, afraid of that at times, right? They don't want it to change, and it has to change. 
And it can change in healthy ways and it can change in unhealthy ways. So these are things that have to be um, thought through. The other thing is that they have rituals, right? Um, whether it's the time that they all take lunch, like, all right, so working at Google, you know, you have the, the smoothie bars, right, that you can go and everybody gets the breakfast at Google when you get there. You know, you have the slides in the, in the main, big foyer from coming down you know, from coming up to down and, and things like that, you have the pods, right? Part of their part of their ritual is everybody goes and checks into a pod and takes a 20, 25 minute nap and comes back refreshed, right? It seems like um, pointless unless you're a grad student and stay up half the night, right? And then you understand why naps are essential part of an essential ritual Hi. How can I help? um so rituals can be practices that are done over and over again rituals can be um can be uh, behaviors, they can be celebrations, right? What, what are the days that the company celebrates? What are the times, what are the people that it celebrates? Like um, at the high school, they started uh, two or three years ago, they started having this um, student of the month, right? And teacher of the month. And you know how it goes, right? Always it's these, these, you already, you can predict almost. Because you know who are popular and who do this and who do that, you can almost predict who's, you know, the nine or ten people who are going to get the student of the month and the three or four teachers that, are, you know, it rotates around every year that they get the teacher of the month. Um, and... That tells us something about that culture, right? The, the things that they celebrate, the people that they celebrate, it tells us who, um, the perception that's important to them, right? Who embodies and typifies that culture? So, um, you know, again, the language, the narratives, the stories. There you go. So when you're in a new culture, they have their sets of stories. Again, we talked about literature. But, all right, thinking of Google. Um, right? Building that, um, that array of servers there in, in that building, there at MIT. I'm sorry, Stanford. Stanford. Um, and then that page. They didn't have any HTML skills. They were great at algorithms, but they didn't have any HTML skills. So all you have is this simple six letters, G-O-O-G-L-E, in different colors, and a search bar, right? The, the plainest, most simple, blank nothing of a, of a beginning, right? To become one of, the, one of the premier curators of information of the world. Right? That story of how they started in 1998 and now here 20 years, 22 years later, where they're at. Right? The story of Steve Jobs and Waz, um, you know, walking into that um, radio shack 
and offering to build him 200 computers, you know, at $500, uh, $500, $2,000, I can't remember what the price was. Um, he, they, had, they had cobbled together one, powered it up, showed him that it worked, and said, um, he said, we want to give you two, uh, we want to sell you 200. And he said, all right, I'll take them. And they worked in their garage and, you know, put it together and to become the new Apple, right? So these stories, these narratives um, show, you know, the kinds of uh, luck and grit and determination and, and, and things that are essential for the, um, for the, that's essential for the culture. So let's come back to mutual respect. What is the opposite of mutual respect? And this is kind of where the this lesson is, is moving to. What's the opposite of mutual respect? Okay, mutual disdain. It doesn't have to be mutual necessarily. It could be disdain. Disrespect. In terms of diversity, what do we say? How about the ugly word? Discrimination. Discrimination. Right? Where people are they're excluded, they're denied products, they're denied rights, they're denied services because of who they are. They're denied access, right? Denied access. Um, the idea of culture is that there is an inside and an outside, right? You're either with us or against us. These binaries are can can be can be um, detrimental, and you know I'm sure y'all have all heard in in your years in uh, the debate circuit all the stories about discrimination, right? Whether it's um, women, you know, making only. 70, anywhere from 73 to 76 cents to the dollar of men, um, people of color, you know, not getting uh, denied access. All the different um, categories. And categories that are not categories, right? Because a person, uh, some things, it do, don't make sense, Right? Um, some some categories have no bearing on the values that you hold, right? Um, the fact that a, a person is male or female does not necessarily say what they're going to, um, you know, how they're going to behave or whether or not they can actually accomplish the... Um, the, the task that's been given them. You know, if, if you look back in the histories of NASA, right, the greatest thinkers, some of the greatest mathematicians were women, right? They didn't get the credit they deserved. Um, when it comes to the theory of special relativity by Thomas Edison, he had the theory and he started talking about it, but it was his sister who had stronger math skills that actually proved it mathematically, 
that it was at, that it was so. All right, so you can't you can't um, discount people. You know, ethnicity and race, gender, language difference. You know, the fact that someone speaks um, with an accent does not mean that they are any less intelligent or less eloquent. Um, uh, I was thinking of just the other day, one of my favorite persons to watch, and I know this is pretty cliche, um, but one of my favorite actors is Antonio Banderas, and he always has this classic Hispanic accent, even in his movies, but he's one of the most eloquent speakers I've ever heard of. Um, another example, um, not that I agree with everything that he says or does, obviously, but Pope Francis, um, Cardinal Bergoglio from Argentina, um, has trouble with the pronunciation of some English words, but he's a very eloquent man. He, he has a way of expressing himself. That's quite, um, quite beautiful, right? So accents and dialect variations shouldn't discount you, shouldn't discount people from a culture. And your values shouldn't be based on um, things that are not values, right? Especially things that people can't control like their gender or ethnicity. Language barriers do exist. Communication barriers do exist. And there is problems with um, bridging these language barriers. But um, being able to do so has many, many benefits. The, the world has fallen. We know that communication is broken. And it's broken um, in more ways than one, right? It's broken not just from, you know, those without to those within, those inside versus those outside, but even inside a culture, communication is broken, right? Sometimes I feel like the people that are in my culture don't get me nearly um, as much as people from other cultures. So we have that, that experience of differences of diversity. And, you know, if it wasn't for, trans, uh, for language and communication issues, then there wouldn't be any need for translators, right? But because of that, then um, I have some level of job security there. Religion and spirituality, where you have a question of dogmatics, right? What is true or not true? What is valued or, or not valued in, in the area of religion and spirituality? Um, ableism, right? People with disabilities. Um, not all disabilities are visible, right? Everybody has a, a disability in some area or another. Um, it may be a, um, like cultural or mental um, inabilities or incompetencies, right, that hold them back from being able to be or, or do what, what you would want them to do. Generational differences affect, you know, how, how you perceive and what your values are sometimes. And that's a whole set of um, issues in itself. Now, as you are coming back to this idea of being fluently bilingual, right? Fluently bilingual, quote-unquote. 
where you can manipulate and have competencies in more than one culture. It's important for you to, to know yourself, to do a self-assessment to start with. All right? Um, let me see if I've got it right here. I had it right here. Page one of four. Here it is. Yeah. Um, I'm going to post this up, but this is going to be one of the things that you're, you're going to want to do, all right, for homework this week. The Organizational Assimilation Index. Um, it's a self-assessment. You're going to go through there and give yourself a score on all these questions. I feel like I know my supervisor. My supervisor sometimes discusses problems with me. Um, so pick a culture in which you participate and make some analogy, and try to like visualize yourself going through yourself in a culture situation, right? Some of you, most of you probably have jobs or have had jobs, all right? Um, you can write at the top of your page, in this job, I, and then assess yourself based on your experiences in that job. Um, and whenever I say a job, I don't just mean you know, working at McDonald's. You know, your job might have been um, working as a student worker in a department, or it might have been working as a cast member in a play. Um, you know, um, working in in some kind of internship, working in some kind of ministry. Any of those would would work, right, in, in an organization in which you participated, you were a member, a participant in that organization, um, assess yourself in that and, and see if you can learn something about yourself and how, um, how you react within certain circumstances. Um, how, how flexible are you about learning new cultures? learning new languages. And, and then then add the scores together and it will tell you something about your competency. All right. We're almost out uh, of time. Here's here's an example of perceptions, right? So a lot of communication, miscommunication, even in a family, even in a family, we tend to um, to train each other to respond in certain ways, right? Unfortunately, within families, there's a lot of, we know the other persons in our family so well that we know how to push their buttons, we know how to manipulate them, uh, they know how to manipulate us, right, they know how to push our buttons, and so we end up kind of training each other into certain behaviors. Um, frankly, some of them can be hurtful, destructive behaviors, Right? And some of these are described here, right? When a person describes these words he or she heard or this behavior he or she noticed, right? I noticed you rolled your eyes during my presentation. Um, you know, what does roll your eyes even entail, right? Did they have a gnat in their eye and they were blinking it away? Um, did they um, notice something out the window and look to their left? What does roll their eye mean? 
right? There, there could be any number of interpretations. Um, but we tend to interpret it very personally, right? It was directed right at me. I'm the most important person in this, in this scenario. Therefore, um, it reflected on me. I don't know if I said something that annoyed you or if it was just you have a bad, you're having a bad attitude today, right? I'm not sure if you're angry about the meeting or you just shut the door harder than you intended to or just as you were walking, a, a, a stiff breeze popped it, right? When a person asks others to clarify their words and behavior as well as their interpretations, then, then the other thing kicks in, which is the subterfuge, right? You can either be honest and tell them, well, this is what happened, or maybe you did intend something, but then you don't want to admit to it, right? And so then you, and so there's this, there's this kind of dance that goes back and forth. And the more you know others on, in, your, in your culture, the more this dance happens where you, um, you know, and it's, again, it's the brokenness of our human nature. We tend to, um, we tend to do that. All right. Um, that's the last that I've got for today. Thank you all for bearing with me. Um, I will be getting the, this video. Like I said, I have the other videos um, uploaded to YouTube, and I'll be posting them shortly, probably after debate practice tonight. But um, I'll get those up as well as this one here, uh, as well as the PowerPoints that go with them and make those available to y'all. Thank y'all for participating with me. I want y'all to be successful. I want y'all to be able to do well in the workforce, and I hope that um, my experience will be a benefit to each one of you. And we'll see y'all.